Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. This is an incredible event, and it's really great to see so many people come together and talk about this very important crisis. Um, yeah. Um, so as California residents, I know that you all know, <laughs> we've experienced the adverse impacts of climate change. Across the state, we've seen rising temperatures, droughts, and fires. And we've become too familiar with the smell of smog or smoke filling gray, ashy skies. And many of us have had to evacuate or lost our homes. And today, I want to note that certain populations in California are disproportionately affected by fires and other climate disasters. Due to gentrification and red lighting policies, populations that are Black, Indigenous, and people of color or BIPOC populations live in areas that are more likely to be exposed to fires, petrochemical plants, fossil fuel operations, and other forms of air pollution. In fact, Black and Hispanic communities are 50% more vulnerable, and Native American communities are six times more vulnerable to fires than white communities in California. Additionally, Farm workers were forced to work in hazardous fire conditions for hours at a time. Given the harsh cramped conditions and the fact that the coronavirus more easily transmits in polluted air, these field workers, many of who are Latinx, are three to four times more likely to get sick with the coronavirus. The disproportionate experiences of BIPOC and marginalized populations are a clear example of environmental injustice. While everyone witnesses the adverse effects of climate change, these communities have one, significantly less protection from environmental health and health hazards, and two, do not have equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. And the thing is, environmental injustice in California started long before the fires. Fossil fuel operations, oil drilling, extractions, refineries, and petrochemical plants have historically been located in low-income, marginalized BIPOC communities. And by being exposed to these emissions and pollutions from the operations, marginalized peoples are at a higher risk of cancer, respiratory illnesses, and other health problems. Um, as Senator Stern mentioned, a really great example is the Exide Technologies battery plant, which emitted lead into the atmosphere in Vernon, California, near a predominantly working class Latinx population. And even though the plant closed in 2015, the toxic, toxic lead levels have still not been cleaned up. So why are BIPOC communities disproportionately impacted by pollution and climate change? This is a consequence of the centuries of systemic racism and classism. Due to segregation, redlining, and gentrification, among other racist policies, marginalized populations are denied opportunities to live in clean and healthy communities, often protesting against corporations who forcibly build industrial plants in nearby areas. Wealthier and predominantly white communities hold the economic capital to assert that they don't want industrial plants in their backyards, leaving BIPOC people to deal with them instead. So we have to understand that climate change is not only about rising sea levels or melting ice caps. It's about tangible human impacts on populations all around the world that are happening now and were happening before. In order to acknowledge and work to stop these impacts, we must incorporate environmental justice into mainstream environmentalism. By creating a more inclusive space in our climate conversations and activism, we open the door to more perspectives and voices, voices that can create real change. The people who are most impacted by climate change, primarily Black people, Indigenous people, or people of color, should have the biggest seat at the table in the fight for environmental justice and against climate change. I also add that environmental injustice is a global struggle, a struggle with consequences that extend far beyond the borders of California. 
I witnessed this myself, across the Atlantic Ocean in my home country, Lebanon. The root of the climate crisis in Lebanon is corruption. Although the inadequacy of the Lebanese government was revealed to the international community after the Beirut explosions in August, government corruption began much longer before these tragic events. In fact, I visited Lebanon during the height of the garbage politics scandal. The Lebanese government was so ineffective at waste management, they decided to burn their trash, releasing an enormous amount of pollution and greenhouse gases into the air. And it was the people who experienced the results of the government inadequacy. Trash not yet burned was piled along our coastline, intoxicating our air and our beaches. The real tipping point occurred for us after the Beirut explosions in August. In addition to the tragic direct casualties, the pollution from the explosion still contaminates the air, devastating human and environmental health in the region for many years to come. The Lebanese people are beautiful, and I've met some of the most kind and inspiring individuals during my time there. But the real issue is that the everyday Lebanese resident is disproportionately impacted by climate change and air pollution due to the corruption of a rich elite government propped up by foreign interests. And let's be clear, the long legacy of imperialism and colonialism, as well as the presence of foreign corporations, sustained a corrupt government and led to the political failure and subsequent environmental consequences Lebanon faces today. And I also want to point out that the Middle East and North Africa as a whole is devastated by the consequences of air pollution and climate change. One in 10 people in the Middle East die due to air pollution. Ahuaz, Iran is the most polluted city in the world. Yemen faces extreme water shortages due to droughts, which Saudi Arabia weaponizes in their war in Yemen all while sitting on the board of U.S. lobbies that fund climate change denial. And that's where the U.S. comes in. The United States and other developed countries must recognize that being responsible for the global system that perpetuates these social inequities, they are also responsible for the environmental injustices faced by marginalized communities, countries, and identities all around the world. While we all encounter impacts of climate change, marginalized peoples, not only in the US and the Middle East, but also in Africa, Asia, and South America face the worst of it. So what can we do? I mean, this is a very daunting situation. We have to center BIPOC and non-American perspectives in environmentalism. Even though the conventional narrative of rising sea levels and temperatures is very valuable, it can also feel very abstract and distant. Emphasizing the perspectives of people who have long experienced the consequences of environmental misuse will make the crisis feel tangible, bringing more people to take action. It would also help us to dispel this idea that the mainstream environmental movement is for white elite Americans who have the resources and time to think about climate science. We are all in this fight. A social movements and environmental movements are actually closely embedded. If we truly want to stop climate change, we must also advocate for black lives, Native American rights, the Latinx and immigrant community, as well as an end to the Yemeni crisis and the genocide against Uyghur Muslims. This is true justice. We must unite together by acknowledging and addressing the effects that race, gender, nationality, and class have on environmental experiences. So I ask that we always seek to make connections between social and environmental injustices. I also ask that we interact with the environmental justice groups in our area, 